but now I can't see the massive crowd in front of me. Welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for coming here on the last session of uh, a very busy week for you. I, I realize that we're all at standing between you and some quiet time in the sunshine. Um, we're here to discuss enterprise strategies for cloud-aware applications. Ultimately, that's what everything here is all about, is how we move all of our business and all of our workloads into the cloud. My name's Steve Wally. I work in the strategy team in the Helion uh, engineering team. And I'd like to each of my panelists to take a moment to introduce themselves. We'll start with Kathy. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Kathy Spence. I'm a principal engineer at Intel. I've been doing a lot of work um, over the past five years around cloud computing. I'm a huge proponent of platform as a service and cloud aware application design. Hello, my name is Gerd Prussmann. I'm chief architect at Deutsche Telekom Products and Innovation. And I'm since three years with uh, Deutsche Telekom and I develop with a development team and an operations team the first OpenStack production platform. Hi, um, I'm Leong. I'm principal engineer for Liberty Mutual Insurance Group. Um, my, prim my primary role in the company basically is to um, try to educate or evangelize the developers on building cloud-aware applications. Super. So um, I want to start the panel off with a question or two and get people going. But please, if you have questions, please step up to the microphone. That's the way we'll get everybody recorded properly because we, we are live and being recorded. Um, so first off, I'd, I'd like to ask Kathy, um, can you give us kind of a quick overview of what are the differences between kind of traditional workloads and cloud-aware workloads? What, what does moving into the cloud mean? Okay, could you please advance the slide? That would involve me to know what I'm doing. <laughs> Okay, great. I know this is a little bit of an eye chart. It may not be easy to see, um, you know, especially from the back, but what you see on the left is kind of is the before picture, right? This is the traditional uh, application. And what you see on the right is the cloud aware application. So um, now what you'll notice is that there's a lot more going on in the cloud picture. Right, so on the left, you see a, a, a typical uh, three-tier client-server type application with all of its layers. Um, it is, uh, you know, bounded by a static perimeter, and it has typically a synchronous connection to a one client device operating system browser. Okay, and what you see on the right, the Cloud Aware application has been decomposed. So what you see is that um, it's not all about one client device. It's a whole spectrum of devices, including things you know you can see in the picture, like cars and trains and things like that. So our notion of client endpoints uh, is changing, and it's an asynchronous connection um, to uh, the, the cloud at the back end, which is, you know, um, running in a very dynamic perimeter, right, with components that scale out, and then you'll see there's like orchestration and composition uh, engine in there as well. So there's a whole lot more going on in the cloud, and then to the very right, you see that it's everything is instrumented because you've got a lot more moving parts, right? And we want more applications to be written in that cloud-aware model. So, um, so as we think about moving forward into this new cloud-aware world, Leon, do you want to take us through some of the benefits of, of what it is to be in the cloud and to have a cloud-aware app? The benefits? The benefits in some of the architecture that you'd build. Well, maybe you want to put on the next slide. Well, <laughs> yeah, as you can see from this slide, actually, um, there's quite a different um, um, cloud-aware characteristics here that you can see. So one of the benefits of moving into a cloud-aware application is it is resilience to failure. So if you try to build a cloud-aware application, um, it's, for, I mean, it's, it's designed for failure. So it's easier to maintain in a way. And it's also resilient to latency. So these are some characteristics that you resilient to latency as well. And it's secure in a way and location independent. So especially when you're um, building um, cloud-aware applications, so you try to make it um, in a way that it is location independent. So it doesn't matter that where the cloud, where the application, being, where the application is being run on. So it can build applications and running on different kind of platforms or even different providers. So these are some uh, uh, cloud-aware characteristics as well. And if you are not building a cloud-aware applications, potentially you are actually um, 
preventing your application uh, to move in the, into a hybrid model. So if you p try to build a cloud applications, and it gives you a lot of benefits and helps you to move into the hybrid um, architectures. So resource effic efficiencies as well, so it can minimize a lot of cost. And a lot of automation can be done through cloud web applications as well. Super. So Garrett, when we were talking earlier, um, Deutsche Telekom took a slightly different approach to this, this massive portfolio of applications that you have, and how would you start to think about moving things into the cloud? Do you want to discuss that a little bit, please? Um, yes, we are offering a software as a service model currently, for example, and we are moving traditional applications often to the cloud. Um, and what we are seeing is that um, there are no cattle applications, There's, there are only traditional applications available currently. So um, we have to consult um, the ISVs, for example, that um, offer these uh, applications for us to the end customers and offer them services on the, on the cloud so that they are able to consume the cloud um, also with their um, old style applications. So on the one hand, we are offering cloud resources like virtual machines and CPUs and all this stuff and um, automatic installation or automatic configuration. But on the other hand, we have to support and help the ISV to change his application to consume the cloud more efficiently. So for example, we um, try to convince him to rewrite parts of his application. For example, if the application uses um, functions to store data on the, on the local file system, we try to convince him to consume an object storage and to write this part of the application to be able to um, being failure resistant um, against the failure of the storage, for example. Um, we offer a set of services in this area, for example, um, reference tenants, live tenants and development tenants so that the customer, uh, the ISV, has the chance to develop his application on our cloud and um, test it before it goes to production. Super, thank you. So this is a kind of a new style of computing. Everybody's trying to get their head around what, what do we do. And uh, Garrett made reference to, to cattle. I, I, I don't, has everybody heard the expression pets and cattle before? A show of hands if anybody does not know what that means. Good. Um, so, what are some of the challenges that you have when you try and take a traditional application and start moving it into the cloud and turning it into a cloud-aware application? Do you want to start, Kathy? Okay, so, so challenges. So in the enterprise, specifically in the enterprise, and we're here to really talk about enterprise computing and, and you know, private and, you know, whether it's your private cloud or whether it's your public cloud. Um, the, you know, the reality is that the enterprise has a lot of legacy applications. So, um, you know, so what I've heard is some organizations, what they, what they focus their cloud on is all the new applications, all of the, you know, greenfield type applications. Um, and then you, you don't have as high a barrier. I think that, you know, um, there are some cases where you might be porting some applications over. And I think that you want to do that when, you know, you're at a major design decision at an inflection point in your app where, you know, it's, it's a major type of upgrade. Maybe it makes more sense to do some re-architecting of the app at that point. Um, one of the things that we're doing in Intel IT is we have a program called Five Star Apps, where we want all of our applications to run across all of those devices that we saw on the previous slide. So what it says here, cloud backend, multi-platform front end, we want the apps to run over phones and tablets, as, as well as, uh, you know, PCs. Uh, you know, laptops and desktops. So, um, so that particular program is generating a whole set of uh, development where there's new development going on to write a bunch of HTML5 front ends for legacy applications that sit in the back end and then connecting those through services. So, you know, and that is a great target also for, um, you know, to put that in the cloud. And personally, I feel like apps are going to run across multiple environments anyhow. I may have one app and it's got components that are, you know, uh, maybe they're legacy components, maybe they're sitting on physical infrastructure uh, in the back end, maybe there's a component that's running on infrastructure as a service, another part's running on platform as a service, and maybe it's consuming a SaaS app all at the same time. 
Yeah, we made kind of the same experiences, for example, with legacy services consumed by these applications. Um, we had to replace uh, databases or um, we had in one case um, the situation to onboard an application that used local storage and local storage in the cloud is not very, very uh, common use case. And we invent and implemented something in, in OpenStack to deliver this uh, local storage. And I'm happy to hear that this customer now um, is, um, is also happy to, to use um, a storage backend um, from, from, S, uh, from a Ceph cluster, for example. So um, he learned something do, during this process. And I'm really happy to, uh, about this. Um, the main problem is that the applications are developed for a limited number of CPUs or servers. So the focus is to um, deliver the application via a predefined set of servers and CPU resources. And in the cloud, you have the, this horizontal scaling with an unlimited number of CPU, and you use it when you need it. And that's a very different approach. So for example, if you think about Google and Map Reduce or Hadoop, then we have the possibility to compute over a huge data set and deliver the data in sub-seconds to the, to the user interface. This is never possible with a limited number of servers, for example, in, in an on-premise installation. And to um, develop applications for this style of um, cloud is very different from the traditional approach of uh, software creation. And this is... Um, this must be reflected if you bring this application on the cloud. So you have to deliver either legacy services on the one hand, and on the other hand, the application should be changed in some aspects to make it more resilient against failures. Yeah, I mean, one of the key challenges that I can see for enterprise developers is the design mentality. So um, traditionally, I mean, most of the enterprise developers used to be developing application targeting for the tra traditional um, infrastructure. So things like, I mean, um, sometimes um, the, developer, the developers will put in some sort of static information in the application. Some developers also try to use a static IP pointing to a particular um, um, a database service. And that kind of thing is, is not going to happen in the cloud-aware applications because if you're going to in the cloud-aware applications, you're not going to put all this kind of static information in. It's not, it's not going to scale. So design mentality is quite um, is a big challenge for, for us to educate our developers and to, to understand the differences between um, traditional applications and cloud-aware applications. And some, some, sometimes, I mean, uh, we talk about design for failure, and mo most of the existing developers doesn't build that into doesn't build that failure and resist, failure resistant fe features into their applications because they think that I mean. Um, they expect the server or the virtualization uh, machines or VM there should be there. But when coming to the cloud web application, that is totally a different different model. Because um, in the cloud web, cloud web infrastructure, uh, the cloud-based infrastructure, the VM became disposable. So any time that the VM can go up and, up and down, I mean, you can spin off uh, VM, uh, 10 VM right now, and then 100 VM later, and then scale down to 10 VM again. And this kind of design mentally has to be changed because if you don't design in that way, uh, in the cloud away way um, uh, methods, and it's going to you are not going to scale your application or infrastructure in in, in a in a massive scaling uh, uh, mechanism. Yeah, and one of, one of the other challenges from an application standpoint, application feature standpoint, is um, identity and access management, which has been um, you know a big challenge because individual apps have used uh, different types of um, you know uh, approaches. You know whether it's a Kerberos or Windows integrated authentication, and uh, developers are are used to doing that in the traditional apps. But the problem is, if you do that, you're tied to that server, and you can't move that workload around. Or if I, we wanted to burst that to a public cloud, you couldn't do it. So really, you know, um, you know, uh, introducing OAuth and web services for for IDAM is another. That's been another big challenge for us in tying that back to enterprise identity. We, we were actually lucky enough. I, I haven't been with HP very long, but I was. I came out of an IT shop, 
Uh, I was running the platform engineering group just as we were starting to experiment with some of these things. And that was, we went through that inflection point, and one of the first things we were lucky enough to do was to be able to break out identity. Now, we were a, a medium-sized business. It was 1,000 employees, 100 in IT. We were running 1,000 production uh, servers and another 500 backing that. But that we were, we were lucky we didn't have that exact problem. Right, right, you know, and I just want to be clear that I'm not talking about Keystone where your developers need to authenticate so that they can use the platform and create infrastructure. I'm talking about the apps that land there need to have a model so that their users can authenticate. That's really what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and that's a good bridge to, this is a brand new world Enterprises tend to have large, well-developed practices and processes for doing things. So how do you handle the cultural change when you start looking at uh, the changes that need to happen in operations and in the infrastructure team, the changes that have to happen for developers? Kathy, do you want to start? Okay, I don't want to hog things, so. um, though. You, know, you can we're... pass it off. <laughs> no, I'm going to answer. I know, okay. <laughs> So, um, you know, yeah, we've been engaging with our developers actively, and we're trying to educate them around the characteristics of, of Cloudware applications. You know, I think personally that it is, you know, not, uh, it's, it's not revolutionary. I think it's evolutionary. I think cloud gives you reasons for wanting to do, you know, really follow all of the good practices. You know, the, the core of it is small components designed to scale out. Right, and so now this, you know, that now this gives you a reason for wanting to do that because now you can be massively scalable, and uh, so we're we're creating design patterns for developers so that they can um, have examples. Uh, and the other thing that we've been doing is we've been hosting some internal hackathons with our developers. So basically, they can you know work on we don't care what application it is, but um, they have to uh, you know they can bring in an application that they've been working on, or they can create something from scratch, or they can start with one of our example apps, and then th as they uh, demonstrate the Cloudware characteristics, we give them points for that, and we uh, you know give a, a prize at the end of a day of, of the day, and it's a, it's a one day enterprise oriented hackathons for um, for our IT developers. Super. Um, Deutsche Telekom is not really a software producer, so we are delivering products to our customers. Um, but at least for, for the internal departments we are working with, we see a, we see a development in, into this direction. So we try to help the other departments that want to onboard applications on our platform and we try to help them to um, introduce development models for, for cloud applications, for example. We onboarded one application that is um, currently running as a um, private end customer application on um, a traditional data center installation, and it was changed from the same development team that developed this application to another business application and this is and this business application is now hosted on our platform and it's quite different so um, the adoption of cloud development technologies um, and models already started that's um, that's very interesting for us uh, um, I think education 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 you always have to educate your developers on moving into to cloud one of the things that we did in the company is um, we try to educate to um, to let the developers know what is a cloud uh, what is a cloud based infrastructure how does it look like and what is the differences between cloud based infrastructures and why you want to build a cloud aware application because one of the things is for example a lot of lot, a lot of de developers tend to use stateful information and when you move into cloud you have to move into stateless so we have, but why they will have to move into that kind of model so we have to show them that well, this is a cloud-based uh, infrastructure. If, if you don't do if you don't do stateless information, it prevents the infrastructure to scale because you have to tie the sessions to each VM, which make it difficult for you to scale. So education is very important. So we do a lot of so-called tech talk, or um, try to educate the, uh, uh, the developers, show them um, what is OpenStack and even what is AWS. How are going to run a VM? How does it look like? And the VM can be disposable, and the IP address is not going to be static. It can be dynamic. It can be changed over time. So education, education, educations. 
And I, actually, I'd like to build on that a little again from the experience I had prior to HP. Uh, we had an enormous amount of technology debt. Um, I, I was laughing. I, I heard a talk last week where they were saying, apparently, as developers, we've all been doing it inefficiently for, for decades now. Um, so there was this idea that, OK, so how do we get people? And there was a lot of fear in this medium-sized company. How do we get them engaged in this? And so we literally carved out a small team of folks to pick a particular example application that worked very well along with the rest of the main application suite. And we built that. We had to almost do it as a hackathon. It was very quietly done, pieces at a time over a couple of months. But then we turned around and used it as a demonstration in front of the executive team. And that's, they were excited enough because we were able to show them simple numbers. And it wasn't wildly you know, deep metrics, but simple numbers of what we'd been able to accomplish in a reasonably short amount of time that was much more flexible when you're talking about that expansion out to things that run on templates and such. They had a very traditional fixed Internet Explorer web interface. And now all of a sudden we were showing them something that ran on tablets and their phone. And once they were excited, the pull through culturally across the rest of the operations and infrastructure team, as well as the development team, it, it was incredible. All of a sudden, it was like everybody wanted to start to learn these new things and to be a part of the excitement. Uh, and, and that was quite the thing. And, and when we did that small exercise, we made sure that we were, it was very much a cross-team effort. There was developers involved, but there were also absolutely uh, the infrastructure guys were inv involved on the back end. So it was very much a collaborative effort. Well, you know, one of, one of the things for the developers, a lot of things are changing for them right now. So development teams are, they're moving to agile methodologies. They're trying to do CI, CD in their environment. There's all of this guidance around, you know, um, you know responsive application design. Right. And now we're asking them to look at uh, the cloud piece of it as well. So there's a lot of change for them. So I think the real key, along with education is providing enough tools for you know I like to call it make it easy for them to do the right thing you know and use the the carrot approach as opposed to the stick approach and one thing to add on is um, one thing that we do we're trying to do is to create some sort of reference architectures to show the developers we put out some example applications so that will help the developers to understand okay this is a architecture how does this looks like and then we provide some sample application. If you want to do this kind of architecture, this is a sample app. You can use it as a sample. And then from that sample, maybe it can be a very easy application. My, my first Hello World cloud applications. So that helps the developer to learn and to build a cloud application, cloud aware applications. Now, uh, I know we've had a few people come and go since then. Uh, if the, the, does the audience have any questions? And if so, please step up to the microphone. Um, while we're going through that. So one of the things we haven't really talked about, but you hear a lot about in the hallways, um, the idea of hybrid clouds versus public clouds versus private. Do each of you want to take a couple of minutes to talk about some of the experiences that you've had working, either choosing not to or choosing to work with any of these particular models? If you're building application for hybrid model, especially in the public cloud, I think you have to be concerned about bandwidth and the so-called data transfer between your application because that costs money. So if you, try to, if you build an application in, within your own premises, you don't have the concern about, I mean, you don't have to spend too much of concern about um, the data transfer fee between, within your own premises because it doesn't cost money. But when you come into the public cloud model, if you develop a media streaming applications, the bandwidth is going to cost you a lot. So you have to think about how to minimize the bandwidth transfer between your application if you're building cloud aware application for in the public cloud. And also, um, one of the things that we did before is a, a media transcoding application. If you look at, for example, if you're using AWS, and a AWS, they charge you uh, the VM um, in terms of by, by hours. If you use a VM, for example, if you run a transcoding task, and the transcoding task is finished within 10 minutes, you still have remaining 15 minutes. And if you build your application, in su if, you build, you try, if you try to build your application in such a way that you can make use of the remaining 50, 50 minutes and that will help you to save money because you don't have to spin off additional VM to complete your transcoding task. Because, if you, because the AWS model, they, they charge you by hour. If you, you, if you use 10 minutes and 15 minutes or one hour, the cost is going to be the same. 
So we, we have somebody at a, at a microphone. May I step out to the mics? OK. Please. My question is regarding ephemeral VMs. So I think everybody seems to get that keep state out of the VMs. Um, but in OpenStack, outside of Swift, we really don't have a good means of HA to keep state. If you guys could elaborate that on, on that. And for us, we're keeping our databases like Oracle and Hadoop outside of that environment. And, it's, and those are the problem childs, right? Okay, so so I can for Intel IT. Um, so th another reason for CloudAware apps, right? Um, and we're encouraging folks uh, to deploy multiple instances of their app. So you know, start up two instances of your app, put it you know put it behind a local load balancer. You kind of get that for free if you use the platform as a service, right? And then it becomes more about the d the data. Um, so uh, you know, uh, and we encourage that. Um, you know, for like state type information, you could use a service we offer with our platform as a service. We offer like Redis, which is very good for um, you know uh, you know some basic state information. Otherwise, just go ahead and use a database for that. Our database as a service is separate from our cloud environment, um, where we offer it's it's a full HA database, and then um, we have a self service interface to that where they can request like give me a MySQL database. We we provide back the connection string and the credentials, and then they use that connection string. We do the care and feeding of the database behind the scenes, the backups, the high availability. We take care of all of that, and they just have to worry about their tables and their data. And uh, that's working really well for us right now, and it's a very popular service. Um, we have the state information currently um, on the databases on the platform, and that is a problem, and we discussed this already. Um, and we might shift out databases to the to the data center from the platform, but until today we haven't haven't done this. Um, yeah. I think the key thing is um, there are still application that requires state information, but the key thing is you're moving away the way you maintain the state information from the front end layer or the web layers to other other components such as using Redis or even to the database. So that will help you to scale your web web layers. So I'm not saying that you cannot do state applications, but it's just you're moving the, uh, the place where you hold the state information to other components. So to, to follow up, we're doing the same, same thing with the philosophy of keeping the databases on the outside and database as a service outside of OpenStack. The challenge is, is that using um, heat for doing a declarative model for what that infrastructure looks like, uh, we've had to extend heat to describe the database as a service and provide that as an extension. It just seems like that should be part of OpenStack, you know, even if it is dealing with something outside of OpenStack. So, so I just want to be clear, our database as a service is actually deployed on top of OpenStack. Oh. You know, um, but, it's, but, it's, but it's separated and it's, and it's built in an, an HA type of a model. Hmm. So I just wanted to be clear about that. I don't know, do, does anyone want to comment on the, the second part of that? about it being built in. So I, I, one thing that's been on our list is to look at Trove. Um, and uh, we, we haven't really gotten around to that yet. Um, so I'm not familiar enough with that to, uh, to really comment as to whether or not that provides a, a lot more um, capability. But there's also another component in OpenStack, right, that, that is also, um, you know, HA databases that's being developed right now too, isn't there? Talking about the uh, the HA database, again, if I have to really meet all these requirements, my database also has to be distributed, right? Mm -hmm. Like our like, like right. our web and app. So is that getting a lot of momentum in the industry or not? I mean, for me, I mean, as far as I know, we are not getting that much traction at the database layer to have a really distributed database and keep the data in sync and across the globe if you really want to go as a, a cloud model. That is my first question. Like. Uh, is there any best practices that OpenStack Foundation actually providing that, okay, here are the framework that you can go with the distributed database for production applications so that they can really uh, adopt to that model? My second is all these talks are within the uh, platform and the infrastructure layer only. Uh, if that is so uh, compelling, uh, the, the higher executives 
who are actually supporting this business applications should also be there. And they, it has to come from them, right? So we are all the ones who are going and marketing uh, that here's the, um, the benefit there, compelling drivers. But I don't see that much of traction happening in that side also. Any thoughts on that? Okay, so I'll, I'll answer the first question um, about distributed databases. And um, so there's, there's kind of like two models for your application for, for HA, right? So generally you talk about um, active passive, right, where I've got two instances of my application and one of them is the active one, and then, we, and then we'll, we'll swap over to the passive one if there's an outage, right? And then there are active-active applications where both instances are active at the same time. And this way, the users that are local to that app use the local instance of it, and then they both interact behind the scenes with local data, which then synchronizes behind the scenes, right? Um, and, and actually, you know, we've also experimented a little bit with active, active, active applications, where I might have an application in multiple zones, maybe even one external to Intel, right, where it's kind of a, a similar model. And the big challenge with that is all about the data, right, how you do that synchronization. Yes. And uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different, you know, methodologies, um, you know, to, to do that uh, synchronization. And one of the things, you know, especially if it's more of a global type of application, there's an opportunity to do something that's called eventual consistency, right, where um, where you don't, you, where basically you take that applic, you, where you take that table, right, um, that everyone is updating, and you uh, and you split those rows across, uh, you know, instances of the database, and then you synchronize them. You synchronize them eventually over time, so they're not. So so you have some of the local data you know, cached, you know, uh, you know, I'm not really talking memcache here, but I'm talking about, you know, you have that local data and they get the responsiveness they need, but then over time uh, you, you deal with that. There are other strategies as well for how you deal with that. And I think also there are certain databases that lend themselves to, um, to that type of a model too. So, you know, depending on what kind of a, a database you're looking at and some of the new NoSQL databases, you know, like, like Cassandra, yeah. for example, you know, uh, looking at those as well. So it really depends on what your app is trying to do. So other, other comments? Um, for our offering, it's, it's much easier because the applications um, are not very huge, no very big applications. So we offer MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB, for example. Um, and it depends on the application, um, if it runs in active-active mode or active-passive mode. Um, so it's um, not about global uh, distribution of data, for example. Um, in general, we have all the, the servers available, highly available and in active, active mode, and that's limited to this platform only. I think there are also different approaches to tackle this kind of problem, because um, if, you look the if you look your applications as different components, so we can start moving your um, um, web front end, the application end to the cloud model, whereby keeping your database at the existing models. And this is one approach. And um, we are trying, we are also trying to, I mean, at the moment we are trying to experiment. We have some, um, run, running some experiment by moving um, the MySQL um, uh, instances to the cloud environment. So, for example, you can, you, you, we, we actually use um, a Nova instance hosting the uh, MySQL servers, whereby we're keeping the data using on the center volumes. And if the, as uh, Katie mentioned just now, you run into active passive mode. If let's say in one of the, let's say the master SQL servers went down, and this can be fail over to the slave one, whereby you spin off an additional instance to actually retake the um, center volume to get back the data. And I just have one more comment, too, on the data, too, that I think is really interesting, is that um, as the data gets bigger, you know, uh, you have to kind of rethink your strategy, too, for your application design. And uh, uh, has anyone heard of the notion of data affinity, right? You move the processing to where the data is. You don't move the data to where the processing is, right? So you kind of have to rethink that as well. So, okay. Oh, what was your second question? Your the second, second question, question was the, uh, from the adoption perspective, right? So it is, 
majority of side times it is infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, talking okay. about this open stack, uh, move, migrating to open stack. So actually, we are the ones who are actually going and pushing it upwards. Then they're coming from the, um, uh, from the, from the higher ups who are actually managing the business or managing those applications. So you see what I'm trying to say, right? So the, the momentum has to come from them that, okay, they realize the, the value of the cloud. So my, I want to okay. port my application to the cloud and those things. I mean, I, I still didn't see that kind of adoption. In so the so the adoption, yeah. So you know the so from an adoption standpoint, right? Um, and I already mentioned, you know, tr let's make it easy for them to do yes. the right thing because they want to move as quickly as possible to land their apps. And the big value of the cloud for the developers is that they are not hampered. They. Um, you know, they, you know, in a traditional, you know, application, right, I would have to, you know, I'd ha not only have to write my app, but I'd have to go buy a server, I'd have to figure out where to land it, I'd have to go through the whole governance process, all of that stuff. That's pretty slow, you know, that can take like six months, right? But then when you use the cloud, you know, you're going to be able to move a lot faster. And the, the faster that they can move, that's really the value that they're getting. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and as, as I said before, I'm a proponent of the platform as a service because it's, it's not just about the provisioning, right? Um, so if you are a developer at Intel and you want to use infrastructure as a service, a typical application for us is um, deployed into three virtual machines with a security group. And, uh, and by uh, uh, at de facto, you have now become a server administrator at Intel. And so that means that we hold you to the same standard that we hold all of our server administrators. And you are responsible for the security of those servers. And you're responsible for the patching of those servers. And you're responsible for if there's an audit of those servers. Right? Well, a lot of developers don't really want to do that. Right? But if you use the platform as a service and you connect to the platform and you push your app, the IT hosting team takes care of the servers. There's no server provisioning, right? There is, um, you know, and, and I can scale re really fast, right? So, um, you know, so understanding that as well. I think, you know, maybe it won't matter in the future if you can do it super fast, you know, if you've templatized your application and you can do it super fast and you can rebuild and tear down as, as opposed to patch, then maybe things will change a little bit more too. But I think we're just, you know, I, you know, I don't care whether you call it infrastructure or platform as a service. I think OpenStack has components that are more platform as a service than infrastructure as a service. But, you know, maybe that's more of a religious discussion. Sure. And, and so, some of what we, we were looking at is, so infrastructure as a service that can often get spun up as it's a cost-saving thing in IT, but when you start looking at platform as a service, that's actually how fast can you deliver apps for business value. So it, it's both sides of the budget get involved. And, and it's, it's interesting to play the discussions that way. But the reality is delivery just starts happening faster, especially when the appropriate... Yeah. Everybody keeps talking about DevOps, and when I was on the IT side, it was like, well, that's nice, but we actually have a group of people in infrastructure and operations that really do know their jobs, and it's giving them the tools to deliver faster, and then giving the application developers the tools to deliver faster. And the automation of that was giving us that speed without necessarily having to tear the entire culture apart and convince them that, well, you're, you're, now everybody's DevOps. So... Please. Yeah, I, I just want to share uh, sort of my experience uh, with helping some, you know, quite a few, you know, CIOs and CTOs with their cloud transition. Is that the, the hardest part is uh, changing uh, people and processes. Technology is easy. Um, to answer to answer your question here, uh, the gentleman who asked the question earlier, like why it's not coming from the business business side of things? Uh, why the higher ups and the CE level execs are not saying that hey, we need to move to cloud? So their goal is operations, right? They are not. Their goal is not creation. So we have to separate these two entities: creation versus operations, right? So uh, for uh, for operations, they are looking for business continuity. They want less disruption. They don't want um, their like mission critical applications broken when they're sort of trying to move, when techies say we want to move those applications to cloud. So people, processes are more important uh, and, and it will just take time. And, and from, from what I have seen in the market is that most of the applications are moving from the periphery of the enterprise. I, don't, I want to get, sort of 
hear your comments on that. So there's a systems of innovation, if you will, and the systems of records are not moving because of the monolithic uh, amount of data behind those systems. So if you can shed some light on sort of different tiers of systems and which systems sort of make sense to either migrate or rewrite or just do some sort of layer on top of existing applications, that would be great. I, I mean, I hope I understand the, the question previously. Previously, So we're talking about the values, right? I mean, the values of um, um, moving uh, uh, into the cloud aware applications. Yeah, from the application to perspective. So like critical application versus uh, you know, mission critical versus like, you know, kind of that tiers. Okay. Well, I mean, um, in, in yesterday, yesterday um, we have a session talking about um, enterprise enabling business agility for um, um, op uh, for OpenStack. So we talk about um, the, the, the va measuring the values. So um, sometimes we talk about um, uh, if, when we build an application, we also talk about we always mention about um, uh, we want to build a reliability systems. Okay, so so how traditionally when we build reliability systems, um, we tend we tend to use a lot of hardware-based solutions, hardware redundancies, or using expensive hardware to increase your mean time between failure. But when it comes into the mission-critical applications, we also talk, if you want to make this become highly um, reliable, right? So how, how can you make a system become highly reliable? So basically, it, either you try using mean time, uh, try to increase the mean time between failure, or reducing mean time to repair. So if you move into cloud-aware applications, you use a lot of automation stuff, auto-scaling, auto-healing uh, methods. You can reduce your mean time to repair, and that helps you increase the system reliability. Because system reliability is about mean time between failure, mean time to repair, and availability. Do you have anything to add to that, Kathy? I think we're out of time. Well, are we out of time? <laughs> you, you want to get your question in, though. Well, if we are out of time, I'll ask um, I'd encourage you to come up to the panel. I'd like to thank everybody. Like I said, it's been a long four days, and thank, thank you, you so very much, much for being here.